Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with City of Winnipeg City Councilor Jeff Rawadi. But before we jump into that interview, I want to take a moment and say we would like to say thank you. From the bottom of our heart, thank you. We couldn't do this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds lights on issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. And it comes from dedication from people like yourself. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked on the show notes or visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, on to the interview. Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start off with the question that I start off all my interviews with, and so you're no exception to this question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I've I've always been interested in, in public affairs and the you know the betterment of our community. Uh, when I was young, I uh, my junior high school library I started getting into Time magazine and Maclean's magazine and became a regular reader of things like that. And my parents, you know, were not political animals in the least, but uh, you know they got the newspaper and you know we would talk about the affairs of the day. And uh, when the opportunity came up uh, uh, to run for municipal office in two thousand six, I took it and uh, no regrets since. So what was going on in young Jeff's mind to say, one day I'm going to be a counselor? Or did you ever think to yourself that I would want to put my name forward? And then in 2006, the opportunity arise. What was the journey to municipal office for Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess um, I sort of started getting a bit of a, a stronger feeling for politics and that when I was in high school, uh, my English teacher asked if I was interested in becoming a page at the Manitoba legislature. So back in the, the mid nineties or early nineties, uh, I got to run around the uh, Manitoba legislature, getting coffees and documents for, for MLAs at the time, all the parties and uh, an opportunity to listen to the debate that actually happened on the floor of the, of the legislature. Uh, following that, I did get involved in the, uh, the, the Manitoba PC youth. And uh, between 2002 and 2004, uh, I worked for the Manitoba PC caucus and uh, then under uh, leader Stuart Murray. So I was involved in the 2003 election campaign, uh, you know, on the provincial level. So I was advancing the leader, uh, driving the leader around. So I spent a lot of time time there. And I figured, you know what, at some point in the future, you know, maybe once I'm well into my 30s, I might be interested in, you know, running into uh, for political office. Um, in 2006, what, 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 was the, was, what was the draw of municipally? Because that background yeah. just there seems more interested, more uh, provincially, but you decide in 2006 municipally is where you wanted to start your, get your sort of yeah. uh, teeth involved in politics. You know, the municipal world is the stuff that affects people's everyday lives. You know, you could change something dramatic tomorrow in national defense policy or monetary policy, and, you know, you're not going to notice it right away. Same thing, even, you know, most people don't have daily interactions with the healthcare system. I mean, if you have school-aged children, education, sure, but, you know, you wake up tomorrow morning and you uh, flush the toilet and the water's not there. That's your municipal government. You know, you need emergency services. Uh, the boulevards aren't cut right. Even, you know, the timing of, you know, traffic lights on your commute to work, snow clearing, uh, all those things that touch you daily, you would notice the municipal, if, if we win and if we fail on the municipal service, you notice it right away. And it's stuff people understand. So, I mean, I, I want to see, you know, good, e efficient uh, I want, you know, the trains to run on time, the buses on time, I suppose. But, uh, you know, uh, again, I just I, I, I get municipal politics. I think uh, I appreciate that, you know, uh, we need to do better in some things. But I, I and that's and that's the sort of thing that I enjoy. You talk about the issues and particularly if the water doesn't turn on or the garbage doesn't get picked up, you hear about it. Now, you've been in office since 2006. You were first elected in 2006, reelected in 2010 and then so on and so forth. Um I'm imagining, and I'm hearing this a lot when I speak to municipal councillors from across Canada, the issues are not just municipal issues that you're dealing with now. And even back 10, 15 years ago, these are not the issues you're dealing with. You're dealing with a range of issues, whether it be education, whether it be healthcare, particularly in the last few years. Uh, and then you're also dealing with what the role and responsibilities of actual jurisdictional municipalities are dealing with. 
How has the role of municipal government changed in your t- tenure as a councillor? And do you still see it changing and evolving to address more provincial and federal issues as time goes on? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the one file that's, you know, really changed in the last little bit, you know, again, the uh, Winnipeg's and municipalities' roles in housing. Um, you know, I know some communities across Canada, particularly in Ontario, social housing is a municipal responsibility. Here it's not. So largely, you know, Manitoba housing, social housing in that has been the responsibility of the province. Um, so, you know, I've been on the board of the uh, the Federation of Municipalities for some time, you know, five, six years ago when they started talking about housing, I'm going, that's such a non-municipal file for me. Like it's, I may, I may as well, you know, grab a coffee or read my email. It just seemed quite irrelevant, but with the, you know, the housing crisis out there and with, uh, you know, the need for, for immigration balanced with, um, you know, the housing availability, uh, it has become more of a municipal issue. Like how can we speed up, you know, approvals of new, new subdivisions, um, you know, promoting densification, um, speeding up things and, you know, reducing red tape for getting permits and uh, um, new, new communities to get them on stream. So that, that for sure is a municipal role. Um, but even beyond that, I mean, you know, it, um, but I can imagine, I, I can imagine that you're dealing with a lot, a lot of issues on a regular basis, how how do you balance that? Because your role as is in the municipal jurisdiction, and yeah. you never want to overstep your boundaries and talk about provincial issues or even federal issues. But when residents come to you, they want you to address them. <laughs> and I, I say this all right. the time. They don't, and I'm not trying to say people are uh, ignorant or unaware, but they don't care. I think that education is a provincial matter or housing is a municipal or federal issue. They want you to address it because you're their elected representative. How do you balance what the residents are talking about with what you know is your responsibility? Again, if it's a municipal responsibility, I really do try to help them. And, you know, I I think people are pretty reasonable in saying that, you know, hey, you know, why does, you know, uh, why do all the school buses go down my street every day at three o'clock? It's too much traffic and they're, and they're speeding, you know, Hey, you know what, I know the people at the school division, I know the trustees, I know the head of the transportation department at the school division. So you know what, we'll we'll forward it on. And you know, again, it's, it's not. Um, but again, where there's, you know, sort of the, the, the multiple levels playing into it, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, housing is a good example. Uh, even, you know, we do get a fair bit of support for roadways. And, you know, where does the jurisdiction, you know, cross over between the, the perimeter highway, which is provincial versus, you know, Lage Modier Boulevard, which with, within the city of Winnipeg, you know, we deal with all aspects of it. So it's, we... We, we we try to help out. I mean, the one that's, you know, strange is like street lighting. You know, we pay for it through our property taxes, but it's in, completely managed and maintained by Manitoba Hydro. So, you know, the level of support that I can give them and saying like, you know, when are my lights going to come back on? It's like, I actually don't know. I don't have, you know, the right person's contacts within Manitoba Hydro to say, but, you know, there does seem to be a pattern. If it's, you know, a lot of lights on a major street, they get fixed more quickly than if it's, you know, one light on a on a residential bay. You've been in office for some time now, and you probably have seen a gambit of issues come across your desk, whether it be uh, municipal issues, and we'll just stick into the municipal realm right now. What role do you, and and I say you as in the royal you, as in councillors as a whole, yeah. play in addressing issues on a municipal level? Because you have to be aware of a lot of things in your community, particularly the needs and wants of your community, but you ultimately at the end of the day have to make the tough decisions. And sometimes they may not please every single person as you could probably imagine. So how do you see your role in addressing the needs of your residents, but also ensuring that you have to stand by what you vote with uh, vote at the end of the day. And sometimes you're going to upset some people. How do you see your role in balancing that role, the responsibility of a counselor? Yeah. I mean, I try to be exceptionally communicative. Um, I love that. I have a North Kildonan, <laughs> communicative. Yes. Uh, the North Kildonan, I've got a North Kildonan Facebook group. Um, Facebook was in its infancy when I got elected in 2006, this group started up in 2007. So it's, you know, one of these, in some cases, nefarious neighborhood, you know, groups where people complain about the strange things over and over again. You know, I saw a group of kids with backpacks. It seems suspicious. It's like, no, they're just kids that, you know, in many cases that are riding around with their bikes with backpacks, but and maybe they're out too late. But regardless, um, what it does, though, allow me to do is like when residents have an issue and, you know, something as simple as, you know, why is it why is this sidewalk on a major street where a lot of seniors need to use it to get to the grocery store been 
non you know, I haven't worked on it for weeks. I might not have heard about it if it wasn't for the Facebook group or somebody called my office. You know, calls the 311 sometimes don't get a, the appropriate response. So I love getting involved even at those micro level issues. I mean, I have a full-time assistant. We've got good relationships into the bureaucracy. That varies by communities. Like, I mean, in some places there's a very strict separation between, you know, council and you know being at the board of director level versus people at, at the operation level winnipeg we seem to be a little more hands-on for good and bad reasons um but it does sometimes get us um uh, uh, you know results because you know we you know when things warrant it you know we can we can escalate it to the right person sometimes you talk about being communicative and, and i appreciate that and i love that word and i love when uh, counselors do talk about communications because it is important but and i ask this to a lot of municipal leaders and i it's always fascinating to hear we are seeing the rise of online disrespect and i use disrespect in the the true word here because people are very angry right now and i think it's a phenomenon that's happening across canada how do you be communicative with people while trying to be respectful and ensuring that you get the respect that you deserve and even your staff members get? Because yeah. we're seeing some harassment coming going on in Canada right now, particularly when it comes to municipal leaders. How do you balance respect with communication? Uh, I, I mean, if they're not residents of my ward and they're being completely disrespectful, sometimes I do let it just go by the wayside. I, I, I right. don't respond. But you should be you'd be surprised how many times like, you know, uh, there was an issue recently uh, of a new cell tower going up in in, in, the, in the ward. And it because of the way we're spread out, there was no logical place to um, hide it very well. Uh, the communications company Bell MTS ended up uh, partnering with a, a cemetery and putting it sort of in, in the middle of a cemetery, but in a fairly single family residential neighborhood. Now, municipal responsibility um, is basically, you know, from a land use planning perspective. Residents, however, were all up in arms about the potential impacts of communications towers and, you know, potential health impacts. Health Canada, very specifically, Industry Canada, Health Canada, very specifically says that cannot be a reason that a municipality says this is not an appropriate location for a tower. So in this case, they found a, uh, a cemetery where it is hidden as possible for being within residential neighborhood. And they very tactfully uh, used a, a structure, a three pole structure and uh, covered it in part with uh, a cross because it's a Catholic cemetery. Um, it actually turned out better than I even expected. But again, you know, um, you know, cell phone tower or cell phone equipment and that is like literally tacked on the side of apartment blocks. It could be, you know, a couple of meters from a, a kid's crib. In this case, you know, it's it's in a residential neighborhood, but there is, you know, a fair bit of separation between the uh, the tower and, the, you know, the closest home. So it's, um, but again, some of the the comments I was getting from the public, though, were were, were horrendous. Um, you know, just why aren't you out here with a pitchfork with everybody else? It's like, well, you know, there is legitimate cellular hole in this area. Um, you know, by, by my parents' house, you drive down their street, you drop calls on a regular basis. Um, you know, I, people... I just I just recently drove through Winnipeg a few weeks ago, yeah. and I can tell you, there was sometimes I was like, "Why am I not getting a cell phone service in a major right. city in our country?" But here we are in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, they're trying to fill in some of those holes. People expect you know that type of service, and anyway, so I, I mean, I felt I felt I handled it right, but because you know there are people on this group that you know lived right by there, they were really you know trying to get at me and say, Jeff, you know, do, do more. Whereas the rest of the neighborhood is like, Hey, you know um, we need this service and Jeff's on the right track. So, you know, having, you know, counterbalancing points of view on, on a group like that is also positive. So again, you know, I, I, people stop me at the grocery store and it's like, Hey Jeff, you know, I can't, I can't believe what you put up with in the, in the Facebook group, but you know, Hey, um, I really appreciate what you do. I don't agree with you every, everything you say or do, but you know, I, I appreciate, I understand your thought process and where you're coming from. And I, and I think that I, I'm very transparent. I sometimes say too much. I got into a little trouble earlier this year talking about a, an experience I had uh, with uh, some people experiencing drug issues, waiting for a transit bus. Uh, I was getting my car serviced and I was taking a bus back to uh, a car servicing center after council and uh uh, I felt a little unsafe. And anyways, I responded to something on, on the, on the North Cologne Facebook group. I used a descriptor that was probably um, a little hurtful to some people. And anyways, it became a, became a problem. So but I you're do human, have to sometimes, though, aren't you? Are you human? Of course because, I am. 
And and I don't think that a lot of people understand that. They think that you're an elected official, so you have to be prompt, uh, like like 100% correct 100% of the time. But you're human, and there's a personal sure. there's. But I'm I'm not I'm just trying to be respectful there because there's a there's a private life of a counselor, and there's a personal life of a counselor. The private life is I'm just Jeff, and then the the per, public life is I'm Counselor Barati. Bro, what Sorry, I apologize. So. How do you balance that? Because I can imagine there's days that you just want to be Jeff and just say what you want to say. But as a counselor, you know, you have to do that. And I say this to a lot of people because I think that's the biggest challenge that a lot of municipal leaders who get into public office don't learn until probably three, four years in that there are two faces for a counselor now at the public and private. Have you found that balance? A little bit. I mean, yeah, I I mean, Again, I, I try to be honest and true to my who I am, you know, in my political life as well. I mean, sure, sometimes you have to uh, watch, you know, dot, watch your P's and Q's and, you know, make sure you get everything, you know. But um, and I think people are generally fairly respectful. And, you know, I, and I generally still, I mean, you know, 19 times out of 20, if somebody does want to stop me at the grocery store or, or at a, you know, Smitty's or Boston Pizza, you know, when I'm having a beer, most of the time I really still don't mind. I mean, sure, there's that one time where does your family late, though? Yes. Pardon me? Does your family mind though? Because I can imagine they yeah. just want to spend time with Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, generally it's not a big issue, but yeah, I mean, there's that occasional time where, you know, dinner's going sideways, dinner guests are coming and I have to run to the store and then you get five people wanting to bring up, you know, an, you know, a local issue. It does happen. I'm human. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, Hey, you know what, can I just get, get your number and call you back on Monday or whatever. And people are generally respectful when you do it that way too. But again, most of the time I, I don't mind uh, talking to, to people. I, I want to turn to my second segment here because I'm cautious of time and I know you are a busy person. And I, before I, I ask this question, I'm going to preface this question by saying this. This isn't a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy at counsel. We seem to get a lot of emails about this question for some reason, but hopefully people understand this is the counselor's opinion. So counselor, right. in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Winnipeg today? Uh, well, I, again, I think the biggest issue at the moment is um, issues related to addictions and homelessness. Um, the number of petty crimes, the number of the, the lack of feeling safe in, in, in areas that, you know, has now expanded beyond, you know, sort of the downtown core where you expect around, you know, various social service providers to to see some of those issues. It's, you know, people inhabiting bus shacks, you know, way out into, into suburbia now, uh, living under, you know, bridges or camping out in, in public spaces. Um, how we address that, there's not an easy, not an easy fix. Um, it's, to me, it seems the route we're taking is making things worse. And you look at communities like uh, Vancouver or Portland, where, or, you know, parts of California, where, you know, they've, they, people are very compassionate and they've, they've chosen approach. And in, in my opinion, those types of things aren't working. So um, that, that in my mind is the biggest issue right now. You mentioned something that is a traditionally more of a provincial or even federal matter, mental health and addiction. And that is that seems like there's a lot of downloading. And I say downloading in the respect that it deserves because it is happening uh, onto municipalities. But municipalities are not suited for this because they do not have the funding. They do not have the money to address these issues. So what does Winnipeg have to do in the short term? And I, I say that in asking the opinion of the councillor. What does yeah. Winnipeg have to do in the short term to address this issue? Because if you don't do it now, if you wait till the provincial and federal governments get their act together and sit down and actually work together in a trilateral way, This is going to exacerbate. So what does the city need to do now to sort of address these mental health and addiction issues? Well, again, I mean, when people leave their home and they're in the public sphere, um, a degree of safety is expected for the pop uh, for the population because, you know, municipalities do provide policing while, you know, we don't direct the operations of the Winnipeg police service. You know, there's the, the police board that, you know, says, you know, this is how things generally operate. You know, we do set the budget and your municipal taxes do pay for policing. Um, so ensuring that we have a, a properly resourced police service, 
uh, that when you're in the public realm, especially, uh, there's a level of protection provided through police. You can't have a police officer in every corner. Uh, Mayor Gillingham, which I support very strongly, um, promised last year, and we're in the process of creating our first uh, transit security team. Right now, in the past, it's been uh, some transit supervisors that had limited roles to help with, you know, uh, incidents on buses, as well as police, of course, but now we're, we're taking it to another level and um, launching a, a police or a, a security team um, that are to be dedicated to, to Winnipeg Transit. So again, you know, we're, we're not fixing the problem at the municipal level, uh, but we are providing a role in terms of, um, you know, the safety of, of the population is the municipal role. And again, like you say, you know, we do have to be there for for partnering. I, I know on uh, this this coming up weekend, Mayor Gillingham, along with his homelessness director, which is a new position within the mayor's office, are heading to Houston, where they have been doing some stuff that they claim is working. I'm 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 I'll, I'll acknowledge I'm a little on the skeptical side. I, you know, in some in some ways, I think you know taking a a hostile approach is sometimes the right way because there are still more people coming to Winnipeg that don't have the resources to live here and. If you know Winnipeg is seen as a not uh, hospitable place for that type of lifestyle, maybe they won't come in the first place. I, again, I'm just concerned that the, the approach that some of these communities are have taken in the past and we seem to be moving towards hasn't been working. So it's it is frustrating. Do you see Winnipeg as being the hub? Because you're right. Um, when you have a large community like Winnipeg, uh, yeah. people flow into the communities looking for services. So that puts a strain not only on the municipality, but also puts a strain on the services that the municipality has already in place. Is it straining yeah, the, the staff and administration of what's going on? And that if more people are coming in, it's going to exacerbate the issue even further? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all major cities, I think, in in some respects, are but come uh, to Calgary. Yeah. But, sure, no, I mean, like you know, even you know, even secondary, you know, municipal hubs in Manitoba, you know, has, has, see similar issues. So, yeah. Um, I, I want to talk because you talk about how mental health and addictions seems to be the biggest issue, in your opinion, facing the community right now. But if I go ask 100 people in your community, particularly in your ward, what their issues yeah. are, they're going to tell me a different a range of different issues. Now, you're there to represent your ward. But when you're sworn in, you're not sworn in just as the ward councillor. You're sworn in as a city councillor for Winnipeg. So you have to balance yeah. the needs and wants of what your residents want for your ward, but also what the betterment of your community. How do you balance the needs and issues that your residents in your ward bring to you with what you what the city needs? Yeah, I mean, I always try to make sure that, you know, my area gets a, its fair share of, whether, you know, infrastructure love, if you will, whether it's <laughs> parks or playgrounds or skateboard parks or you no know, road renewals. Uh, I'm always there making sure that, you know, we're never, you know, left short. Uh, I was quite successful early on my political career that some of the things I campaigned on in terms of major infrastructure, like the extension of the Chief Pegasus Trail, the replacement of the Disraeli Freeway, uh, New Henderson Library, all those things really got done quite early in my my political time. So um, that's allowed me to, you know, focus on some of those other infrastructure projects and other, you know, key city building pieces uh, on a broader basis. But, um, you know, yeah, but you, I mean, but you, you know, know, there's not, there's not enough money to go around to address every single issue. So how do you pick no. the winners and losers? And I hate to put it that way, but I think I need to, because you, you have to look at all the issues that people come to you at and say, unfortunately, yeah. this issue isn't going to be addressed until 2030, because right now we have yeah. to worry about this issue. So how do you balance and did it come back to that communication and respect piece that you talked about earlier? Yeah. I mean, um, I think residents, you know, we're looking for, you know, continual improvement to continual work. So, I mean, you know, we repave lanes here, we repave lanes there, we, you know, upgrade the community club and and do things like that. So, I mean, it's, again, be nice to have more trees, more everything. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's a balancing act. Um, you know, I am the finance chair of, of our council and we are now going into our four-year multi-year budget process. I had my budget working group over for supper last night. That was uh, sort of as a kickoff to, to the process. So, uh, you know, it's going to get hot. It's going to get hostile at times because, again, people are pushing and pulling in all directions. People have different, you know, priorities. You know, you can't have lower taxes and, you know, more bells and whistles, if you will, municipally. You know, we, um, you know, it costs a lot of money to to, you know, maintain those sort of key municipal services. And, you know, no, no politician goes to a ribbon cutting typically for, uh, you know, a new sewage 
you know, pipe or something or a plant. But I mean, we're right now in the process of spending, you know, multiple billions of dollars upgrading, you know, our, our North End sewage treatment plant. Um, it's, you're right, it's it's a lot of, you know, balancing, you know, those needs and, but, you know, also, uh, you know, wants as well. I, I need you to take your counselor hat off for a second. I want you to put your FCM hat on right now because you talk about the fiscal sure. imbalance, particularly in the realm that you are as the chair of the finance uh, uh, air, uh, committee. I, I want to know uh, the FCM has been calling for a new fiscal framework from the federal and provincial yep. government. What type of framework would the city of Winnipeg be looking for? And I want to say that as in yourself as a board member of FCM, but also as a counselor for Winnipeg, what would a new fiscal framework look like for Winnipeg in your opinion? You know, some some form of a growth tax, I think, is probably the the, the most appropriate and uh, and best suited. So like when there's, you know, uh, the economy is doing well when there's more, uh, you know, activity in the economy. We benefit by saving, you know, additional, you know, revenue that way. Um, you know, the only real tool we have for for raising uh, our biggest tool for raising um, revenue for taxes is based on the value of your property. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, if, um, you know, costs go up and, you know, we've got residents that are retired and on fixed incomes, the amount of, you know, their, their, resources that would have to go to property taxes goes up and it's you know based on the the value of their home so it's it's not the best way so I, again i think uh the funding model should be you know balanced on you know the disadvantage of that i should point out too chris is um you know in those bust years you know it could mean less revenue for municipalities and, and in some cases those are the best times like when the economy is tanking that's where you need you know government to stimulate the economy by building more roads or building a community center or, or, or whatever. So it's, I mean, we have the ability to borrow for capital. We can't have a, a an operating deficit at the city, but if, you know, too much is tied to those, those growth revenues and the growth stops, it, it, it is challenging, but I, I still think that is the right, the right answer. Your analogy there of the seniors who are on a fixed income who are facing financial struggles right now is a story that I'm hearing across Canada how much weight do you put on yourself that when you make a decision at council that you understand that you could be impacting someone's livelihood or someone's financial dollar? Because a lot of people are struggling right now and municipalities seem to be getting the blunt of the blame for raising taxes, raising service levels. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure that you're doing things in a financial way that people are going to be less impacted than traditionally are yeah i obviously i mean you know our costs for everything are going up the our costs for labor the cost for the diesel that goes into our buses or our contractors you know garbage trucks or you know nothing is getting cheaper so i mean we're not insulated from these these cost pressures but on the flip side um you know residents uh are at their are at their end too you know the cost of groceries the cost of of everything they're looking for so no i take that responsibility extremely seriously um you know um does it get easier Winnipeg, since 2006 you know, to now does it get easier that you you know that the decisions you're making are in the best interest of the community but you understand that sometimes you're going to have to raise those taxes even if it is 1% or 2% or 1.3% you know, my baseline has always been like, um, you know, I, I try to keep taxes low. I try to provide, I want to see value and, you know, uh, uh, spending the money in the in a, in a, in a right way. Um, so if people see that they're getting that, you know, value for what they're, they're paying, I don't think they're generally too upset on the flip side when they see waste, when they see, you know, issues like with, that we had, for example, with our police headquarters, you know, years ago, I mean, that's, completely um you know frustrating and but you know i can't win I, them I all do think, no i mean but i mean if you look at winnipeg's tax rate you know over the last uh, 25 years um in the late 90s we were among the highest taxed residents um through um you know um some tough decisions that were made by councils you know starting in the late 90s through through now, taxes in Winnipeg have gone up far less than everybody else. And that, you know, in some ways did affect services. There were some things that perhaps, you know, got cut a little too thin. Um, now, you know, especially when it comes to maintaining our infrastructure, that sort of thing is, you know, we, we have to maintain our roads. We have to maintain our, you know, uh, civic amenities. So that's that's starting to happen now again. It's, you know, 
the flip side is there's lots of construction. There seems to be construction everywhere nowadays. So, I mean, why can't they coordinate that better? It's a good problem to have, but, you know, we do need to do a better job, you know, even coordinating some of that construction work. So it's, it's the new season in Canada. It's called summer, winter, fall and construction season. <laughs> absolutely. Chris. No. Yeah. It's uh, so no, I mean, um, Mayor Gillingham ran on a platform of raising property taxes three and a half percent every year, as well as uh, an increase to the frontage levy, which is going directly to pay for uh, some sp specific infrastructure projects. So it was a bit of an anomaly where, you know, a politician ran on raising taxes and uh, was successful. So, I mean, that's the mandate he has. That's what, you know, our the budget working group is going to be working with in our, in our new multi-year budget. So it does give us a, a tiny little bit of room, but I mean, again, because part of parts of it are, you know, pegged to to infrastructure, we're still you know being squeezed on the operating side. Yeah, infrastructure is a big issue that's facing a lot of municipalities across Canada. I know FCM is talking a lot about asset management, and that is a great program yeah. to have. I think it's a thing yeah. that a lot of municipalities need to, but that doesn't fix everything because asset management is basically just lining up and what is going to happen. And you're sort of predicting what's going to happen and when things are going to be need to replace, but you need changes. Now you need infrastructure upgrades. Now uh, is Winnipeg set for the future. If things don't improve financially with a new fiscal framework from the province and the federal government. Well, it's really tough. And again, like, even the delays and sometimes, you know, getting the formalities of, you know, documents signed, like the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program was a, a really strong program. We got those projects, you know, finally agreed to. They were a little slow in getting approved from the province. But like initially, like, you know, the, the, the funding model was, you know, one third, one third, one third. Uh, what happens when the costs go up? It's borne by the municipality. And in, in some cases, it's the fact we were waiting to get the sign off from the federal government. Uh, in the case of like, new transit buses, like, we're eating like millions of dollars in additional costs just because it took so long for the other higher orders of government to sign off on these, what should be, you know, shared, shared projects. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're in a, we're in a tough spot. Um, you know, we're in some cases having to eat these um, uh, new cost realities because of, you know, what, what's happening out there. Give me a so, glimmer of hope no, though. Give me a glimmer of hope that it's not all doom and gloom and uh, they're the, the sad reality is that municipalities have to struggle, but give me some hope that yeah. municipalities can weather the storm. Yeah. I mean, we've, um, we've been, we've been prudent about, you know, making sure that, you know, we stay within our debt limits <clears throat> that council self impose on itself. <clears throat> our, our bond raters and that have all, you know, re reinforced our, um, our, our financial uh, position that, you know, uh, we're still a, a, a very good organization to lend money to. Uh, and this multi-year budget process does give us uh, some, um, through COVID especially, because we had a multi-year balanced operating budget, which we hadn't been doing in the past, it did put us in a better position to deal with the the extra cost pressures that did pop up due to due COVID. I want to turn to my last segment now, and it's my favorite subject because I think it's more important that we do this here in Canada than outside of Canada. But I like talking about tourism. I like learning about communities. I love visiting communities, and I, like yeah. I said, I was just in Winnipeg, so I, I want to. I'm coming back probably this month to visit because there's a provincial election, and I'm a political yes. nerd, so I like watching things. Um, what are some of the hidden gems in Winnipeg that don't get their due when it comes to tourism that people need to visit when they're coming through Winnipeg? Yeah, I mean, Winnipeg, people who come to Winnipeg are often surprised, but uh, all the, the cool stuff we have going on here, um, you know, our, our Assiniboine Park and uh, the zoo and the and the brand new conservatory, top shelf attractions. They're super cool. Like, uh, you know, the tallest waterfall, I think, in the prairies or, or Western Canada, I think, even in, in um, inside the new conservatory with uh, the natural gardens and stuff there. Uh, really impressive building. You know, the only national museum outside of Ottawa, I believe, in the Canadian Human Rights Museum. It's not a happy day necessarily when you look at, you know, what's all going on there, but what a well done attraction. Um, we've got our forks, you know, uh, we're finally, you know, embracing the fact that we're a river city. You, there's a lot of opportunities to get on the river and that and uh, the forks is a neat place to do that. Um We've got, um, you know, some some neat neighborhoods like the Exchange District right around City Hall, you know, go for lunch <clears throat> by City Hall. There's so many neat um, buildings and it's actually <clears throat> how how often you know they're they're used for film sets because we have such uh, a diverse range of of, of stock of, of properties and we have uh, the provincial government has some good uh, um, incentives for the film industry so that's that's super cool 
Um, you know, Gary Dewar, the the former premier, used to um, you know we've talked we were talking about the seriousness of housing before, but one of the cool factors is um, um, at least it used to be the case where we Manitoba has the highest rate of second home ownership. The cost of having a cottage, you know, within an hour of Winnipeg, you can leave work at three or four or whatever on a on a Friday afternoon and have a beer open by five thirty. You know, um, it's it, it, it's it's a really we take our recreation seriously in Manitoba. You know, Friday afternoons in downtown Winnipeg or even at City Hall are pretty quiet because uh, we have that ability. Uh, festivals galore, our our fringe festival, our folk festival. Um, you know, after Edmonton, we're I think the best, the biggest uh, fringe festival in in Canada. Killowen Park has the outdoor Rainbow Stage Theater, which is you know puts on first first class shows every summer. Um, so where, can golf find you? where can we find you? Where can we find you? Golf course. Oh, yeah, okay. you'll find me on the patio. Um, having a beer maybe i i do get some get into some fringe shows i normally get to rainbow stage that didn't happen this year um try to you know I, i'll call it golf but it's uh you know I, I hit a ball around and uh you know compared to calgary we have a lot of golf courses and it's quite affordable um so yeah um that's the reason why i want to come back actually because i, I i'm like you i hit the ball while paul playing golf <laughs> it's more just a time to sit down and relax and chat with people and while just yeah. getting some walking in exactly so no i mean we, we we do very well and if you're into the arts like our arts groups are our are, are top shelf the symphony orchestra the royal winnipeg ballet uh there's the new inuit uh art uh, component that was added to the Winnipeg Art Gallery, uh, the, the original building, a, an absolute uh, gem of 1960s architecture, and the new Inuit Art Gallery, you know, more modern but uh, very well integrated to the rest of the building, and some really neat exhibits in there too. So, um, distinct neighborhoods, you know, our cordon neighborhood with lots of patios and and such. Um, so no, we've, we, we do There's well. There's something for everyone. It sounds like there really is. And, you know, we hosted the FCM conference back in, I think, 2016, uh, you know, the feedback I got from everybody was like, wow, like, you know, I definitely hit above our weight. So we, we tend to surprise people. That's awesome. So I want to end on this question and it's kind of the million dollar question, but what makes Winnipeg such a unique city? Uh, I mean, I'd say it's the people, I mean, like the, the very, you know, we've, People have come from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, you know, we've got lots of, you know, different generations of immigrants that have come here over the over time. I mean, my my mother was born in Germany. Uh, you know, she, she was an immigrant as a young child. But, you know, um, there's there's a lot of um, uh, interesting folks that live here and choose to call Winnipeg home and continue to choose Winnipeg home. So it's, it's that that diversity. I mean, you know, the the cuisines you can find in Winnipeg, like, you know, go try to find anywhere better to you know, find good Filipino food. You know, it's, um, we, we do well in that, that range too. I mean, they used to say we used to have more restaurants per capita than anywhere in North America. I don't know if that was a fact or just folklore, but, uh, uh, I don't miss too many meals. Uh, so no. welcome to the club. I would say that when I was in Winnipeg, I had the probably the best yeah. sit down meal that I had. And it was a lunch meal. I forget the name of the restaurant off the top of my head right now, but I can picture it because it was probably one of the best hamburger and fries that I've ever had. Uh, and it was one of the mom and pa shops that I, I'd never heard of. So I walked in best service, most friendliest people. And honestly, best service, best price for the food, too. So thank you. Um, I nice. want to thank you. I want to thank you so much yes, for doing this, Jeff. Greatly appreciated. Yeah. Um, and I want to take a moment and say thank you for serving, serving your, uh, your community because I don't think municipal councillors get their thanks enough. So thank you for putting your name forward appreciate and continues to serve. So thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. I want to thank our guests for joining us today for a great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And I want to thank you for listening or even watching this episode. Your continued support and interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to what we're doing here on the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is our hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics through our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a pivotal role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page linked in our show notes and on our website at Cross Border Interviews. 
www.thrivingcommunities.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can help deliver the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Music.